Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar session, Understanding and Developing Ornamental Horticulture in China. Uh, although we're talking about China today, we've got a truly international audience with us. I'm talking to participants from over 30 countries now, Europe, Asia, the Americas, and our guests today all work in China and are located in different cities. Um, for me personally, it's really uh, nice to connect to China again, uh, since I have spent a great deal of my life there, first in Beijing, later in Kunming, the city of eternal spring, and the absolute floricultural center of the country. So therefore, let's see if I can also welcome our Chinese participants in their own language, uh, um, yeah, welcome everybody again. Uh, for now, before we before we start, let me give a brief uh, explanation on a few technical details regarding this session. By the orange arrow on the right side of your screen, you can drop down. A, uh, a dashboard and adjust your webcam settings. Please do not hesitate to ask questions during the session by using the question pane, and we will moderate these questions later on uh, to our roundtable guests and to our keynote speaker. Um, also, do not forget to download additional information on China's floricultural sector and FCI magazine. You find that in the handout section. Uh, well, my name is René Snyders, and next to me is Ed Smith. And together we form Jungle Talks, and uh, we have been asked by um, on behalf of the organizers. We are organizing this webinar, and the organizers are AIPH and Foreign Culture International. Uh, we facilitate this session, and we will be your moderators. This webinar will be recorded, so if you can't uh, make it to the session or you have to leave early, then we, you, you will automatically get a link uh, to this webinar to see the webinar afterwards. Uh, today's agenda is as follows. We will start with Mr. Wouter Verheij, the Agricultural Councillor of the Dutch Embassy of the Netherlands in Beijing. Uh, after that, we will have a roundtable uh, with uh, Ms. Juliana Ju. Uh, the Secretary General of the Nursery Stock Department of the China Flower Association, Mr. Just Rose, uh, the manager for Court Dema in China, uh, based in Beijing. Uh, Ms. Catherine uh, Fan Yang, sales manager at the office of Holex in Shanghai. Um, I missed one, sorry. No, Arno, Arno Trau, sorry. Arno Trau is the responsible for the Chinese market on behalf of um, ICL. Um, first, before we go to the round table and our guests, uh, let's now go to Mr. Tim Briercliff, the Secretary General of AIPH. Tim, are you with us? We can see you, we can hear you, hopefully. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rene and Ed, for your introduction. And I'd like to welcome everyone to joining this uh, webinar today. I am uh, Secretary General of AIPH, which is the International Association uh, of, of Horticulture Producers. And maybe we move to the next uh, slide there, please. And uh, AIPH is an organization, our members are associations that represent the interest of ornamental horticulture growers in different countries. And we are the world's champion for the power of plants. So we seek to stimulate demand for plants and to protect the industry, uh, to share information within the industry, to promote uh, best practice and to strengthen associations around the world. Next slide, please. We're very pleased that um, uh, we have within China uh, a very strong member in the China uh, Flower Association and they are represented up into the board of AIPH and we have had a lot of uh, activities within China. Uh, we also uh, partner through Floriculture International with the China Flowers and Horticulture publication, a very important uh, publication for the producers in China. Um, we have been active in uh, approving 
international horticultural exhibitions in China, including Expo 2019 Beijing. Uh, and we have uh, expos coming up in Yangzhou to open on the 8th of April. And then we are expecting an expo in uh, Chengdu in 2024. Um, so we cover a, a, a number of areas, including exhibitions, promoting Green City, as you see through our committees here, and supporting growers directly. We publish statistics through our statistical yearbook in partnership with Unionflow. We run the International Grower of the Year Awards, and we support the industry on novelty protection issues through Flower Auction Market Group and on plant health. Next slide, please. Um, we publish, uh, uh, this is our statistical yearbook. We also, if you visit our website and look under the Global Industry Intelligence Center, you will discover some reports we have published through our International Vision Project on China specifically. So if you are interested in the market on China, please go and visit the website to find that free report that you can download. We also held uh, the first International Ornamental Horticulture Summit in Beijing two years ago, thanks for the support of uh, China Flower Association. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to specifically invite you to a conference we have coming up, um, which is our plant health conference, looking at phytosanitary issues and what industry initiatives to facilitate trade uh, and to tackle plant health challenges. And this will take place on the 24th of March. It's free to attend, and you can find the details on our website, AIPH.org Plant Health Conference. And um, we, this is part of the International Year of Plant Health and also supported by Royal Flora Holland. Floriculture International Magazine is our publication. We produce it uh, every other month. And uh, again, this is free to subscribe to. And I encourage you to visit floriculturinternational.com. We've got a new website, so take a look at it and I hope you enjoy looking at that. Thank you. But today, I just want to thank all of our speakers and participants and uh, I look forward to an exciting and engaging um, webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tim, for your kind words. We will be back. Uh, to you at the end of this uh, session for your closing remarks. Just to the audience, uh, the report you just mentioned uh, on China that was made by AIPH is also enclosed to this webinar. So please uh, check the handout section and you can download them. Uh, together with two edition of uh, Floriculture Magazine uh, who are specialized, well, that focus really on what's happening in, uh, in China. Um, it's time to, uh, to start off with our keynote speaker uh, from Costa Rica via Tim in the UK. We connect to Beijing, to the Agricultural Councillor in Beijing. I hope it works out with the connection because we had some trouble in the preparation phase of this webinar. So Ed, let's see if we can connect with, uh, with Wouter. Wouter, can you hear us? Yeah, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. I, I, I think you can see the type of your, your camera. Hopefully yeah, we, see can, you as well. we can go on the screen as well. I, I try to, but it looks like uh, sharing my webcam um, um, is not really going well. well. The audience just has to, uh, has to really uh, <laughs> listen to you very well. Well, so yeah. welcome uh, to, to this session. Uh, we're uh, honored that you would make the time uh, to tell us more about the general outlook of the floricultural sector uh, of the country. You're based in Beijing, and I would say, well, for the next uh, couple of minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, and good afternoon, uh, all of you. Uh, well, it's an honor for me to be able to speak here at this webinar organized by AIPH and uh, FCI. In my speech, I will focus on long-term trends and developments, but of course, I will also give attention to the COVID-19 affected how they, this, this affected the flower sector in China. Chinese uh, ornamental horticulture and landscaping has a long history. The development of the sector 
came with ups and downs. The opening up of the economy under the late President Deng Xiaoping in the early 90s created new opportunities for the ornamental horticultural sector. Foreign businesses were attracted and brought new varieties and technologies to China. Before 2012, the flower and pot plant market heavily depended on the use of unofficial events. But the introduction of the so-called eight points in 2012 abruptly put an end to this use. The first of these eight points stated, and now I quote, for official visits, there should be no use of banners, no red carpet, no floral arrangement or grand receptions for officials. And this measure, forbidding using flowers in official events, resulted in a temporary market collapse. The sales of cut flowers in Kuming International Flower Auction, the main flower auction in China, dropped up to 50%. Two years later, by the end of uh, 2015, the total market volume had been restored by the growth of consumer spending, and it kept on growing at a steady uh, pace. From 2015 to 2019, the market size of the total ornamental horticultural sector in China has increased to 20 billion euro, with the annual growth rate of 6.2%. The eight points which I just mentioned have accelerated the transformation and innovation of the floriculture sector in China. The transformation from a government-dominated market to a consumer and leisure market service served as a catalyst for the development of the sector. The technology used is, generally speaking, still simple in nature. This is actually true for covered horticulture sector as a whole, so for ornamental production and for vegetable production. In China, I think there is about three and a half million hectares of simple tunnels and other simple covered production. And out of this, roughly one million hectare could be called, uh, called so-called mid-tech uh, uh, solar greenhouses. These are arch green greenhouses, plastic greenhouses, with a thick earthen wall on one side, which serves to keep the warmth in at night. At the beginning of this century, high tech was introduced. Since then, the high-tech sector is gradually growing in size. Nowadays, China has about 800 hectares of high-tech greenhouses, vegetables and flowers, as I mentioned, uh, with technology comparable to uh, what we have in the Netherlands. It's mainly used for vegetable growing. But high-tech slowly also finds its way towards the flower and pot plant production. One of the participants which we have today in this webinar is Just Rose, he represents greenhouse technology provider Kodema, and he will for sure elaborate more on this. The need for better technology has everything to do with changes in consumer habits. Before 2012, flowers were mainly meant for official events, as I said. They had to show off during the event only. But also in later years, there was no need for flowers to last long. Flowers were mostly used as a gift and it had to show up when presented. Only recently, a long shelf life became more important. Flowers are nowadays more and more meant to have at home. COVID-19 accelerates this process towards a longer shelf life as people spend more time in-house. COVID-19 also accelerated other developments. In no other country, e-commerce is developing so fast as in China. Also, the flower sector experiences this. Although at first the e-platforms had difficulties in managing the quality of the flowers, nowadays they are so well organized that the quality of the flowers is often better than when bought in a traditional flower shop. E-commerce platforms and online flower shops control about one third of the consumer flower sales. By centralized purchasing and packaging, they save cost and are able to compete with other players in the sector. They sell mainly ready-made bouquets. Leading platforms are Taobao and GD, and the leading online flower shops. Examples of this are Flower Plus, Reflower, The Beast, and Rose Only. But there are also others, of course. Traditional flower shops also control about one-third of the consumer market. 
They also sell bouquets, but their comparative advantage is supplying uh, complete flower arrangements to it towards events such as weddings. They are often small scale and operate locally, but there are also some bigger chains like the Beast, Rose Only, Chun Bu Zi, and Ji Ren Flower. Flower markets still control one third, the last one third. They often uh, also play a role in the supply of the local traditional flower shops. However, their market share is reducing because of developing of mainly uh, e-commerce. An important aspect of the development of the sector, which I want to stipulate, is the further urbanization of the country. At present, 54% China's working age population lives in larger cities. By 2030, the share of the working age population in large cities is expected to have risen to 72%. This group will not only grow, but will also see an increase in spending capacity. This growing middle class with growing spending capacity will be a major factor in the growth of the flower sector. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now conclude with some challenges and trends. I will start with mentioning five important challenges I see. My first challenge. At present, most of the best-selling flowers and main commercial flower varieties in China are imported varieties from overseas, for instance, from the Netherlands, Britain, Japan, United States. Also, innovation of production technology mainly comes from abroad. Enforcement of intellectual property rights and breeders' rights is still a major issue in China. This results in hesitation of the introduction of technology innovations and new varieties from outside of China. My second challenge I see is related to the quality of flowers. According to the Kunming International Flower Auction, only 30% of the Chinese so-called high quality flowers have reached international standards. This affects the competitiveness of the flower sector in the international market. There's a need for improvement of technology and a need for better management. My third challenge. Post-harvest infrastructure and adequate post-harvest treatment are still underdeveloped. The cold chain for floriculture still has quite some gaps. It's good to see that many provinces develop policies to stimulate improvement of the cold chain, but this is mainly still focusing on vegetables and fruits. And it doesn't make sense to, inv to invest in technology to produce high quality flowers if the cold chain is not in place. My fourth challenge. Although some provinces have issued some supporting policies in order to develop the local floriculture sector, such as Yunnan province, a strong national policy is lacking. Also, a good data collection system for the floriculture sector has not been effectively developed. As a consequence, making good analyses is difficult, which hinders the development of the sector. My last challenge is related to the fact the consumption of flowers is still relatively low. Taking into account the enormous potential of the flower market, there's still a lot of scope to grow. A strong national, national strategy and related promotion campaign is needed to better use the potential of the market. I will finalize my speech with three main trends I see. First, since 2015, E-commerce in floriculture sector has grown rapidly from 1.3 billion euro to 4.6 billion euro in 2019. E-commerce platforms are expected to develop further to reach 6.2 billion in 2021. As a consequence of the COVID pandemic, consumption habits have changed, but buying flowers via e-commerce has only accelerated and will continue. Second trend, new consumer habits and growing middle class in China leads to a growing demand for quality flowers. The e-commerce platforms are well positioned to become major suppliers to the middle class as they are used to use these platforms for the shopping. As a consequence, the market power of these e-commerce platforms will grow and will enable them to more and more dictate the organization of the chain. Reducing cost and improving the quality will become major factors to stay profitable as a producer. 
This will lead to increased use of better technologies, such as modern greenhouses. My third trend, according to the statistics, 95% of the floriculture consumption in Europe and North America is household consumption. In China, non-household consumption, like the flowers used in institutional bodies, real estate, still account for more than half of the floriculture consumption. However, it is expected that home consumption will further grow rapidly. It's expected that in 2030, actually, it will be at the same level as we are used to in Europe. Dear listeners, let me end my presentation by stating that China's ornamental horticulture, for sure, still has some challenges to cope with, but that at the same time, developments in China are going very fast and ambitions are high. One example of this is coming from Shanghai, where the general office of this megacity recently formulated their goals for this sector as follows. Now I quote, by 2025, Shanghai will have first-class research center for new types of flowers, first-class breeding center for flowers, first-class trading center for flowers, and a first-class gardening service center for small households. End of my quote. And along with this, they presented a detailed plan how to reach these goals. And I can promise you that more cities have this kind of ambitions. I would like to end my presentation here by again thanking the organization for this nice and excellent webinar. I'm looking forward to the rest of this program. And sorry for not being uh, in, on the screen, but thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Wouter. Indeed, it's a shame that uh, you couldn't be on screen. Uh, people also asked about your presentation. Um, so I can imagine that we can send out your uh, written text, uh, uh, making up for the fact that we couldn't see you. Uh, yeah. We can hear you fine. Um, so also, once more to the audience, if there are questions about um, Wouter's comprehensive overview of the sector, please let them know to us via the question pane and we will come back to you later uh, after the round table, uh, Walter, when we discuss uh, the opportunities uh, in, in, in China and we just also discuss uh, questions from the audience. So many thanks uh, for now. Please stay with us, at least uh, in sound, and we will, back, uh, <laughs> we will be back with you later. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, we go now to Juliana Zhu. Uh, Tim Briocliffe already mentioned the China Flower Association is the direct partner of AIPH in China. Juliana, you are Secretary General uh, of the Nursery Stock Branch uh, of uh, CFA. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for the invitation from organizer AIPH and FCI. It is a really good opportunity to share the information of China's nursery stock industry situation and trends with the friends from all over the world. I work for the nursery stock branch of CFA. CFA. Uh, this is one of uh, 16 branches of uh, China Flower Association and focusing on building up the links between the government and the enterprises, domestic and abroad in this line, to promote communication and uh, collaboration internationally. So we provide the services of a professional training, consulting, exhibition, as well as the products promote through China Nursery Man magazine and the WeChat social media. So we share all the information with our members all the time. Thanks, Rini. Well, Julian, um, when you talk about the nursery stock, um, then you also see what I also remember from my time in China, that um, the sector was always, always closely related to new and large scale government infrastructure projects. Um, could you say something about that? How, how are the recent developments in that area and, and how does the nursery stock um, business uh, fit into that? Yeah, I think we have to talk about this from the micro level. Uh, Chinese government has always put the construction of ecological civilization in the first place. Ecological construction and beautiful China 
as a China's important development strategy already. Uh, now, many, many concepts uh, as top, uh, uh, typical small town, beautiful royal construction, forest city, garden city, and the big garden strategies, something like this, already put this uh, concept uh, forward by the local government in different level and put them into practice as well. So recently, uh, recent years, and China major projects such as the Greater Bay Area, Yangtze River Delta, uh, Yellow River Basin Harnessing uh, projects, Xinan uh, New Area construction are all abide by this principle of a green development. So, and um, I think this must create huge opportunities for ecological construction. Uh, which leaves a huge space for the nursery stock industry. So I think a national strategic layout has been formed. Trillions of our market size awaits us. So we just imagine only if the nursery uh, stock business takes about only 5% of a total investment, how big market we will face to. Yeah. So now, and uh, how to insist the green development concept and to use the, uh, the advantages of a market, even the Belt and Road policy, seems like this, and to grasp the business opportunities might be considered by the international partners, I think. Yep. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So lots of opportunities. Um, uh, in China, um, COVID-19 seems uh, under control. But no doubt that, that your sector also had, had problems battling uh, the virus or the effects uh, of the virus. Europe is still uh, you know, in the middle of all this. Uh, what can you say about the effects, um, the negative effects of, of the virus on, on these developments, uh, also the, the infrastructure developments? Uh, everything continues, of course, but probably in a different pace. Yeah. It's a so special year, 2020. And uh, compare, I, I think, uh, compare with the other countries in the world, Chinese uh, governance system has demonstrated unparalleled superiority. Chinese people were the first and the most completely survived in the path of the disaster. Uh, in, the half, uh, in the first half year, the whole horticulture industry in China was depressed. The production cost has increased and the best selling per period of a nursery plant was missed and the landscape construction was delayed and the construction fee increased and etc. So all kinds of these factors accumulated. The employees worry about what about the future development of, of the industry. Although and all the people who are involved in the business try to recover the production under the support by the government. One hand, the government has issued a serious industry support temporary subsidies to help the growers or companies to pass the difficult time. On the other hand, and in the second half year, with the control of epidemic situation and the overall resumption of a production, the market has recovered. The government resolutely adopted the double cycle policy especially to strengthen um, infrastructure construction, which accelerate the pace of urban and royal construction, the market, even home garden business are getting warm. So I think most people have been uh, full of uh, confidence uh, for the future after outbreaks. Yeah. Well, you, you sound very optimistic, uh, trillions of investment opportunities, uh, even if the yes. nursery stock takes only a small part, um, uh, entrepreneurs very confident. Um, however, China has never been a very easy country to do business um, for foreigners. Uh, there's, there's quite a, a cultural gap. Of course, there's the language. Um, what yeah. would you, in your role, you have often been matchmaking foreign parties to Chinese parties, you've been acting as a bridge between the two. What are you, what are your suggestions? What are your do's and don'ts when you want to do business in China as a foreign company? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a really good question. 
uh, depend on the experiences of my own. And I think cross-cultural communication and understanding uh, are the most important things when, when you come to uh, have a business in China. Uh, first of all, uh, I have a suggest uh, to you. I think you should find a right person who can understand both cultural background and uh, business principles so as to set up a good link between you and your partners. And second, I think you have to know how to use the policy, I mean Chinese policy, for your program in order to get support from the local government. And try to discuss with the local government officials and when you have difficulties, I think they will help you uh, and your partners to find a solution. And third, I think if necessary, um, I, I, I suggest you have to learn more about Chinese culture and history. You have to show your modest uh, attitude toward the people you meet. Even you are the professionals in your major, I think. But I think the attitude and the kind of a communication way is the most important for sure. So, and the last, I would like to say the Romans as Romans do, which is the really useful all of the world. Well, that means, uh, thank you, Julian. That means that uh, if we go on holiday to China, that at least Ed uh, needs to study a few words of Chinese. Yes, but uh, thank you so much, uh, Julian. Um, again, um, questions from the audience. We will moderate them also to you at the end uh, of this session. So thank you for now. We will be back with you later as well. And again, to the audience, if you have any questions for Julian or any other guest, then please send them to us. Uh, Ed, we'll yeah. go to... Uh, from Hangzhou, where Julian is, we go to, to Beijing. Beijing. We go to Beijing, we go to uh, Mr. Just Rose, the manager of Codema for, for China, uh, specialized in uh, high-tech for cultural projects. Uh, Just, I hope you can, yeah, we can see you, I hope we can hear you as well. Uh, an obvious first question, you're uh, focusing on the foreign cultural activities, foreign cultural developments on, high, on a high-tech level. Is it Just Roses? Is it just roses? Yeah, that's uh, that's my specialty, of course, obviously. So that's what we started with. I think you hear this every day in China, or I don't know where, but uh... yeah, it was a nice coincidence, actually. First project I was actively involved in in China was uh, the biggest rose factory in the world. So it's a nice, uh, nice coincidence. <laughs> I'm also curious about your Chinese name, uh, by the way, just. <laughs> Yeah, that's also a topic of uh, daily discussion. Well, let's, um, well, let's, let's proceed with something yeah. more serious. A uh, short personal introduction on, uh, on you, Just. Please. Yeah, so thank you very much, guys. Uh, happy to join this uh, this webinar. Very nice opportunity to share what I've experienced in uh, the year so far. Um, I joined Kodima about three years ago. Kodima is a company operating worldwide. Uh, mainly focusing on irrigation and cultivation systems. So we became big in the floriculture worldwide, mainly because of our automated benching system. Um, three years ago, I joined the company and about one and a half year later, I moved to China. So that's about two years ago now. I moved to China to set up our China branch. Um, why we went to China is basic. Um, the market was growing, market was booming, projects became bigger, projects need service. So our focus in China is to deliver the best service to our customers. Technical systems are can be complicated, so we need to be there with a technical team. And therefore, our focus in China is to build a strong technical team. Um, COVID was. Uh, something yeah changed the way of working of course for everybody around the world we were just in time we were just in time just before covid um we hired our first people so we had to become independent very very fast and we had to digitalize much faster as expected um so now we're almost 10 people in china and we were forced to operate and to build projects by ourselves with just our China team. So it was a yeah, very fast uh, growth, I would say. 
Yeah, he yeah, handled that quite well, I think. And uh, you even managed to to work with a trendsetter in the Chinese floricultural sector, which is uh, Ibida, amongst others. Uh, can you tell tell us something in brief words about about that project and about similar projects you're working on? Um, yeah, I'll start a little bit how we started in in China is in 2011, about 10 years ago, was a project like Wouter earlier mentioned uh, heavily. Um, pulled by the government um, demand for flowers was Dashun, Tianjin Dashun, uh, one of the biggest anthurium factories in the world. We built uh, their nursery, very, very modern project, but in the end, um, yeah, well, yeah, it's it's wasn't as successful as, as we hoped it would be because it was um, the, the downturn after she had this eight points the demand for flowers became much less so the market collapse project became was a little bit over had a little over capacity so in the past 10 years we saw still some projects but mainly smaller and mainly mix of vegetables and flowers until about two years ago we saw again a huge trend in uh, bigger floriculture projects so one of them was uh, indeed the Lanzhou project with Ibida the project is, uh, was initiated by the Lanzhou government. They helped with, uh, with the funding of the project since the, it's a very nice location to grow, grow flowers, very long days, very dry climate, and the energy prices are relatively low. So the government together with Ibida initiated the project. Ibida is a partner of BOM Group, Dutch greenhouse builder. And together we started this project and uh, in which we did the irrigation and uh, provided the cultivation systems is yeah like we just mentioned biggest rose factory in the world uh, currently half of it is being planted the other half will finish this year uh, yeah impressive projects very 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 impressive and we see more of them popping up all around the country not only in Yunnan anymore but there's more and more of such projects are they company. doing that because of the example that the Ibida is showing, or is it just a natural thing that that not just in roses but in the ornamental sector as a whole, uh, such projects are popping up around the country, as you mentioned? Uh, yeah, the government is supporting uh, by building parks, uh, providing allocating funds to. Just we miss we losing you. Just, Just can you frozen. can you hear we us? Can't hear you. We'll try to turn on your camera. Well, for now we have a slight problem with Just. We will just go for a second to our next guest. It's Catherine Young. Uh, Catherine, if you can hear us, could you please switch on your camera and then we'll try to get uh, just back in the meantime. Hi, Catherine. Uh, Hi. Uh, From Beijing to Shanghai, just exactly. geographically for the Geographic. audience Here we to, go see, a bit uh, down south. to see where you are all. Yeah, uh, Kathleen, you represent a uh, big Dutch firm named Holex. Uh, you represent them in China. Um, what, what, what can you tell us about the flower trade right now, just from your perspective in a few words? What is flower trade uh, all about at this moment? Yeah, but also at uh, maybe Catherine can Sorry. quickly introduce herself yeah, to I'm the going audience. To quick. Oh, well, it's just with my mind still with just. You're bored of me already, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I will try to keep my part short. So good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening and good afternoon for everyone, of course. Um, thank you, FCI, and thank you, IPH, and Renee, and Ed, of course, for having me here. It's such an honor. Um, I'll give you a small introduction on myself and Holix as well. Um, Holix Flower uh, is a flower international flower trading company, both in importing and exporting. Uh, currently, the mother company is located in Ausmeer, the uh, city of flowers in the Netherlands. And now we have two branch offices. One is in Miami, the United States, and one is the one that I'm located in, in Shanghai, China. And I've been joining the Shanghai China office since day one after I graduated from the United States from my MBA. Um, 
sorry, I think my internet yeah, is We can fine. still hear you. We can still hear you. Continue, please. <laughs> right. Alex Flower has already almost four decades years in uh, expertise in long distance uh, air freight delivery. And our goal is always try to strive for the best quality flower with most competitive prices and with the best quality and the uh, best service for our clients. Great. We started, sorry. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I was just going to ask you, your, your, your company is direct sale, uh, focus on wholesalers, right? Yes. Is, is, that, is, that, uh, is that how you, how you got started? Is that the, the, the DNA of the company or is that the future? How do you see that? Um, as I mentioned earlier, that we have expertise in air freight, uh, long distance air freight delivery. And for such delivery with air freight, it, there is a definitely a demand for the minimum quantity, which cannot be reached by just average uh, florist, unfortunately. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we set up our offices in our offices in China to help with the smaller wholesalers. But overall, in our company policy and in general, we are focused only on the wholesalers in right. China. Yeah. Right. Um, and of course, uh, with now with the e-commerce merging up and now with all uh, digital sales, with online sales, uh, with uh, influencers and their live shows, there are, of course, more options offered to the consumers uh, instead of only wholesalers or only florists. But now uh, what we are hoping on is more of a balance of each one doing their own job. And we're more focusing on our best quality flower sourcing. Right. Right. So, so if you talk about, about about what you just mentioned right now, I mean, China in a lot of ways is is, is a leading country. When I think about internet marketing, influencers, uh, does that fit in, fit into a company who still focuses on wholesalers? We can definitely see the dy dynamic of uh, the shifting of the roles, the struggling between wholesalers and florists. Um, but as we were also discussing with our wholesaler uh, clients and our friends of florist, we uh, tend to believe that it should be a more of a balance instead of only competition between both. Because in the end, when the consumers are offered with more options, people tend to search for those with their own expertise. For example, florists, what they're offering are more of a service. And for wholesalers, they are more focused on their uh, products. So the flowers themselves and with their own unique selling points, they will be more strong in the balance instead of only compete. Catherine, I have a quick question just out of curiosity because you just mentioned the influencers and the power of, of e-commerce. Uh, we are in, in Costa Rica. Um, in the Americas, we're not so familiar with these, well, with these uh, events or uh, with these development trends. How does it work? Could you maybe for the audience, if they want to source some more information or which influ influencer should we follow very quick? <laughs> um, this I have been doing a little bit of research, but unfortunately, the most of the influencers that I'm more familiar with are only Mandarin speaking. So if anyone is still interested, I can definitely recommend after the webinar. Yeah. Um, so what they're essentially doing is basically like what uh, in the West you have Instagram, you have Twitter. Well, people are also uh, attracting fans by doing what they're good at. Yeah. And this is happening the same in China, only on our own platforms. And there are a lot of uh, options where people can do live shows of showing their talent, of course, showing what they can attract people, but also selling products. And that's something interesting that we see people are also selling flowers. Yeah. No. With their platforms. Final question for you from now. I mean, time flies. I mean, we were used to make projections for the next 10 years later, it became five. Sorry, Ed, I'm losing you for. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry, yes, please repeat. Yeah, okay. Um, projections were being made for 10 years, uh, about 10 years ago, and now they're made, being made for five years, but maybe even three years. Let's just stick to three years. What do you expect? For your own company and for the the trades in the floricultural industry in china for the next three years just mention the main three topics that you expect to be changing to be changing um 
for our own company, of course, we're always looking for sustainability and we try to maintain our goal of offering the best quality products and offer the best service to our clients that will be dynamic with the market, but always stay the same goal. And what we see the changes with the world, uh, with the uh, markets in China is one is more transparency in the whole supply chain. As uh, what we noticed with the COVID as well, that's not just flowers, but also seafood or imported fruits, they can be all tracked with a COVID test from the supplier to the end consumer. So this is exactly what we're expecting with flowers. Um, this is what we're trying to offer the transparency for our clients as well. And uh, we also see more competition with more and more people are more interested into flowers, uh, especially now with the e-commerce raging up. Uh, there's always uh, supermarkets uh, use of flowers are also raising up, uh, although it's so, still a very small segment, but the family consumption has been also growing up. So we see potentials in that. And of course, it will also raise up the uh, competitions. Right, yeah. right. Okay, transparency, just to finalize with you on, on that topic, uh, is transparency something uh, that, that's a big topic? Uh, ch change is getting shorter. Is, is, is a topic like blockchain technology important, you think, in the future to make that transparency even uh, more visible? I think there are too many ways that's helping with uh, transparency. There yeah. is with the web shop, there is with the blockchain, exactly like you mentioned. And, uh, and now with the consumers, it's, the information is getting more and more accessible. They right. can always switch from one digital platform, jump into a different one. So on one way, that's definitely helpful, beneficial for the consumer side. And the, on the other way, for our wholesale customers, that can be uh, challenging. Yeah. Catherine, for now, thank you very much. We'll try to get back to Josh for a second. If that doesn't work out, we go to our final guest. But Josh, if you can just give it a try to open up your microphone and your camera, please. Thank you, Catherine. Thank Catherine. We'll be back with you thank later. You. Here. Just. Uh, yes, hey, at least. Good day. You? Yeah, we can hear you again. Just we have for you, we were wrapping up with you as well. Uh, basically, uh, at least one more question. Um, the business case uh, to, for companies like Ibiza, uh, for high tech floricultural companies, has that been proven already in China? um it it is being proved sorry I, I just had a power cut i think the lanjo light was turned on but the, the whole house was dark no worries we um, don't yet we can in this case uh in the past the past few years um we saw more and more big big projects became in operation uh flowers vegetables um both of them but until now not that many of them have been uh profitable and the last two years, I would say more and more of them are actually starting to make profit. Um, vegetable greenhouses, but also the yeah the likes um, the companies like Ibiza. But it's not. It's of course production is one thing, technology is one thing, but how to use it, how to get the most out of it, to get the highest output out of your your greenhouse. That's one thing that the growers are now getting better and better at but the whole chain as as Catherine just mentioned there there's still some space for improvement in terms of cold chain in terms of uh the demand side there is a lot more yeah there's a lot of improvement possible i think the business case is definitely there and if you find the right place and you have the right crop and the whole chain works there is a lot of money to be made in china um and the past few years companies are actually starting to make to make real profits even in the high-tech sector is that, is that comparable uh, to the whole sectors uh, just like like amazon or whatever huge multinationals that started up for years and years in a row with big losses but they 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 gained prestige in the market with by making big promises and they 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 they, they did it and they are making profits right now. Is that is that is that a fair comparison to the the, the way floricultural, high tech floricultural projects are being developed in China? 
uh, I never compared it like that, but um, yeah, it's definitely not as scalable as, as an Amazon or something. But they, they need to build a brand. They need to build trust with their with the consumers. They need to, right. for example, Ibiza, they need to show the, their customers that they have supreme quality. And like last year, last winter, the winter was pretty cold in Yunnan. That um, made the supply very limited. So last Valentine, there was almost no roses on the market and a huge demand because of Chinese New Year and Valentine, right. which had a, a huge, gave a huge boost to the price. So the price of roses were never as high as in the last two weeks. So right. yeah, they need to build trust. And that's what you do by delivering the same quality consistently. So if this continues like this, I, I see a bright future for these companies. And you see a bright, this, this is the final question for, for now, just uh, you see a bright comp future for these companies, for your clients. Does that automatically imply that there's a bright future for Codema? And what will that future look like? <laughs> of course, um, we, we try to, we try our best to keep our customers happy and to, to meet their demands and to grow with them. But if we don't adapt enough to the Chinese market, that's, that, that is not an automatic, um, that doesn't mean that we will be successful if they are successful. We, of course, have to learn and adapt as well. And we also have to build the trust with our customers. Of course, that's what that's what that's why we're here for, and that's what we are doing. But if we stay too Dutch, it will not mean that we will be successful in China. Exactly. Well, that may, maybe I said my last question, but in fact, I do have another question. <laughs> if you, I think your, your, your future is quite promising, but do you expect competition in the near future coming from the Netherlands or from other foreign companies, or do you expect most of your competition coming from China itself? Eventually, it will be mostly from China itself, for sure. Right, right. I think, yeah. Okay, for now, thank you very much. We'll get back to you as well, and we go to our final guest. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, just hope that we can see you later on. Uh, we actually traveled to the Netherlands uh, where we will be talking to, to Arna Tao. Arna, we can hear you, we can see you, or at least we can see you. Hope we can hear you, sorry. Oh, that's good. Thank you, yeah. Renee. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Hey, good evening to our uh, Asian participants. Good afternoon for the European ones and good morning for the Americans. Yeah. So I've, uh, introduced, my name is Arnaud uh, Tau, and I'm honored to participate this uh, webinar on behalf of the ICL company. Now, not known for probably many in the in, uh, industry, but ICL is an Israeli chemical limited. It's a public company uh, listed at the New York Stock Exchange and the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, headquartered in, in Israel and uh, a global reach so we cover actually the globe with our flagship brands um I'm, Arnold, I'm, yeah Arnold, do you actually uh, an, a, a so-called old china hand or jong Hong, like uh, we say in chinese you were already doing business in china in the 1990s um correct, you, correct. yeah explain yeah. that that icl is a, is a is a solid brand long history um it would be go it would go too far to to ask you what what are the changes between doing business in china then and now walter in his keynote speech already highlighted a few important developments um what happened in the country in the past say 30 40 years still what is the most significant change that you've seen in in your business well, I see two significant changes, uh, Rene, over the, the past 30 years. And, and the first big change is a quite a complete turnaround about the horticulture industry. Going back 30 years in time, it was really a traditional way of growing plants uh, using mainly organic uh, matter as a nutrient supply uh, for the plant growth. And that has been turned around in a very innovative modern market using technologies like also uh, Walter Verhey was mentioning and, and, and uh, Mr. Rose on the uh, glasshouse construction part to support the plant production. So we see a change from traditional to modern production, innovative. 
Apart from that, we also see a better understanding on, on how to grow pl quality plants. And we're not there at the required level yet, but we see that it is not only nutrients, but it is a complete package what you need to offer. Cre create a clear root medium, subs a clear substrate mix required. And we, and we see that there is an upward trend from bringing, exporting uh, peat substrate mixes from out uh, China inside the country and replace the home mixing by ready mix uh, substrates by offered by specialized uh, companies. Uh, Arnett, you, you with your um, iconic brand, Osmo Code Peat Professional, you're really targeting, you know, high, exactly. the high segment of the, of, of, of the market. Um, despite that, you were already present in China in the 1990s. Um, were you too early? No, no, we were not early. Um, I, I would say Osmocote is a very uh, low uh, barrier, uh, let's say, entry, because actually what you want to do is you want to spoon feed your plants uh, like what we are doing now with the modern technology with computerized systems. We do it with the Osmocote technology also. Each day, a little bit of nutrients you supply to the plant. And especially in the traditional way of growing, it is a very easy uh, uh, method of applying the Osmocote in the pot and, and offer this spoon feeding to the plant and improving plant quality. So at that moment, uh, it, it was not known. It's new, new technology. So you take a step-by-step -step approach. We run many, many demo trials comparing growers' practice with uh, uh, the, the, the plant growth with the Osmocote. And over the years, uh, the, the, the product, uh, let's say, performs and, and demonstrates the differences. So step-by-step, uh, -step, growers are accepting it and moving over from one to the other. Arnaud, let me, let me take the liberty to rephrase Renee's question. Let's just assume that you as a company would have stepped into the market in 2021. Would you have been too late? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We missed the, we missed the boat because we have now an, 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 an position in the market and we are able to grow with the market. Right. And like what we understood from earlier today, the, the market is, is, is buoyant. It, it's growing like anything. And that is what I also enjoy of being in China. It is this vibrant energy around in the horticulture market. You feel that the market is going forward. Yeah. Not step by step, but big uh, big steps forward. They jump forward, right. uh, and if you now need to catch up, uh, you need to jump big uh, to 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 get there. No, well, and uh, we have broad audience today. We have people from China. We have people from outside of China who are active in China, but we also have quite some people with an interest in China. Uh, does this uh, does the implication of what you just mentioned is that? If you want to become active in China, you got to do it now. Otherwise, you're really too late. No, I, I think you should join because the market is big enough. There is enough potential to to step in now. Um, and I'm sure if you step in, you need you first you need a couple of years to have your uh, base uh, foundation set. It is not coming in and you just uh, directly you're successful. You need to invest. Clearly, it is a time matter uh, issue here. If you take time to invest in the market, and we hear that also before it is, uh, it's actually it is respecting the culture, the tradition and the history. When you in, take time to invest, to understand that situation, you're getting there. Eh? And, and, and the cultural aspect is very important because the Chinese, they don't just listen to you. They listen, but they uh, also they want to uh, see it. Eh? Yeah. So you need to come with demonstrations. Uh, and it is not uh, flying in, uh, uh, discuss, uh, take an order and fly out again. That's not the way of doing business in China. So investing definitely means investing in capital, but also in human capital. And in, in capital, in time and in a resource. And a resource is indeed human resource. Right. Uh, and that is also what we heard before. We need to have a local uh, a team in order to make the uh, uh, the connection between the West and the East. Uh, we Westerns, we are very direct uh, uh, Chinese. They listen first and then they speak. So we need to have a tra translator, uh, let's say, between the West and the East to uh, better understand and get the message across. 
Yeah, we, we already understood from Juliana that re respect is also a very important issue, huh? to respect yeah. the Chinese culture, language, traditions, history. Uh, and that is maybe also something that is a, a totally different concept for us Westerners to, uh, to understand well. Thank you, Just. Your camera is working again. <laughs> um, uh, what, uh, what I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Arnaud, yeah. also is because you're in the business of the faster moving uh, supplies, uh, horticultural supplies, how did COVID-19 affect uh, your business? Um, because especially with, with, with transport, I, I can imagine that the last year has been difficult. No, uh, well, for sure, and and actually, it still is. Um, COVID is affecting the business uh, positively, negatively. Positively, we see that there is a higher consumption, huh? the the increase of flower consumption uh, as a result of e-commerce. So that is, uh, uh, and that has been accelerated by by COVID, I would say. But we also see that there is a shortage on on transport, uh, on container capacity going uh, west to east. So from Europe to Asia, which is delaying deliveries. Uh, and that was last year. And that is actually an ongoing issue still going on at the moment. No. No. Um, I just want to have well one last question or maybe Ed has. Well, Ed always no, has no, the last no, question. No, 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 no. But one last no, question, um, um, maybe going back to to those to those cultural um, issues yeah, on. Yeah, on, on, on doing on doing business, what would be your absolute do and don't? Because um, what we well, what I understood from you earlier is you were an avid traveler to China uh, there every say two three weeks. And now you couldn't travel for the past year, uh, so you couldn't see your Chinese clients and team literally face to face, only digitally. Does that affect your business and? And do the Chinese adapt to this situation easily, quickly? How, how did that work? So the Chinese are very open to this digital innovation, I would say, have working with uh, Microsoft Teams uh, and, and, and other ways of, of getting together. Um, but I think the investment over the past years has been on a regular base with the local teams around the table and not talking only business, but having a lunch, uh, having enjoying a dinner together, having drink together, that really helps to, to build a trust level and to, uh, that gives you time to understand the culture and the tradition. And once you have uh, established that level, then it is much easier to follow up on uh, let's say uh, a digital from a distance the connection no all right thank you very so much that, 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 is, that is a must i would say even say here yeah yeah i right. know you can stay with us uh, we will invite the other round table guests to join us uh, because we also you? had some questions from the audience come in so i hope that it works out again we already saw just uh, just camera was working again uh, but please also turn on your microphones everybody and hopefully that works out with wouter as well um wouter maybe your camera by some miracle is is working now but at least we can hear you i think right yeah i can hear you clearly uh, okay my, perfect we can hear my... you as well okay um, it, uh, some questions came in from uh, from the audience. One maybe for for just and um, maybe also for Julien to reflect on on later. Uh, just um, you work with large scale government funded projects now. Are there also um, large scale projects initiated by non government parties? So by private companies? Yeah, yeah, sure there. Are. Um, but currently, I think most of the projects are partly subsidized in a way. Automation, the government wants to bring up the level of automation. So they are subsidizing imports of machinery, etc., which cannot be found within the country. And that's a very natural thing that also happened in the Netherlands or they were also happen all around the world. It's, it's quite normal. And in China, it's, the market is still very much underdeveloped. So they're still pushing it. Um, big companies like uh, Boal, Speedlink, Brighton, um, yeah, many of them are 
private and then mainly joint ventures between Western companies and Chinese companies. And they currently invest a lot in, uh, in young plant factories, etc. in China to deliver high quality, good plant material. Same question, Although, same question quickly to uh, Julien. Julien, you, you reflected in your speech quite on the development on, 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 public, uh, on a public level. How do you see yeah. the, the, the private development in, in nursery stock? Excuse me? How do you see the developments on a private level in nursery stock on the from a market point of view? Um, up to the epidemic, I think everything uh, has been changed a little bit. Uh, first of all, the land has been controlled in some way because the grower has to change the production way. And before they uh, grow something in the ground, but later on, we will suggest them to grow them uh, in container plants. So I think this is the trend for the production, even the private grower, uh, something like this. Yeah. Right. Okay. We have another question coming in, and that's I think that's for for Catherine. Uh, Catherine, we spoke a little bit about influencers and their role and and the way that internet marketing is developing in not just in China but around the globe. Uh, in the meantime, um, yeah, there's this, this topic between programs that are available in the Western world and not available in China and vice versa. Uh, what would you re recommend people from outside of China to use? What social media platforms should they use to get, in, to get into this new world? Um, I think it's definitely a convenient thing that in the west you can easily have access to the social media in china and one of the easiest thing i will recommend at this moment is wechat or weibo that is almost like the chinese uh counterpart for twitter in the west right, yeah, um, right. there you can already have the blog of the influencers where they would post a link for their own individual platforms right Thank you, Catherine. We have a question coming on, uh, coming in for Juliana. Um, Juliana, you focused during your presentation on the questions uh, more on the hardy nursery stock for large-scale projects, but can you also say something about the developments in the consumer market for garden plants? Yeah, uh, there is an experience, uh, not for my own, just about the e-commerce and the develop so quickly. And then just to give you an example, is the, a guy named Uncle Wang. Uh, his uh, total sales amount per year, 2020, uh, has reached about 7.7 .7 million euro. And only one day, 11 of November, this is the festival everybody knows in China, it still has reached about, uh, have reached about 12.7 uh, million uh, i'm so i'm so sorry 127,000. Uh, mm -hmm. so this is a really big figure for one of one day so i think this is the uh, kind of a way to go to the uh, e-commerce or platform to have uh, uh consume consume uh, uh kind of a yeah model but on the other hand, and the garden plants also can go to the the, the big market, like the, the the project from the landscape, and also from the different level, from different uh, royal construction. So I think this is the very good uh, consumer market for the garden plants. So we can go to private for the garden business, uh, a home garden business and also to the royal construction. So the sky is the limit, There's lots <laughs> of opportunities. Yes, for sure. Just, yeah. Uh, just uh, yeah, all the guests are talking about most like uh, pot flowers, maybe the uh, cut flowers, but the nursery stock has takes about almost 60% of a total horticulture business. So I think this is a really big market in China, the landscape. So. Just compare, I say, just compare with the uh, other, like a flower, cut flower, and pot flower, or something like that. Yeah. 
nursery is a huge market. I've already introduced about if you have got the uh, um, big project um, from the government. So I think this is the yeah, it's a good way to right. find the market yeah, opportunities. I think, so. I think all of you agree that, that China still shows huge opportunities on, on different levels on high tech uh, market development, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are problems as well, of course. And one of them is uh, curiously uh, the, the former landlord of, of Renee when she was living in Kunming appears to be online as well. And he's asking about uh, breeder rights, about plant protection rights. How is how is that situation right now? And I think I will ask uh, Wouter Verheij about it. Can you update us a little bit on the UPOF uh, 80, what is it, 87, 91? I think 78, 78 91. 91, exactly. <laughs> Walter, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. You can hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so so, so China signed uh, UPO, but not the latest version. Um, and uh, and I think they, they showed interest in, in signing the, the latest version. Um, but, um, but I think there still has to be uh, discussed uh, uh, several things, and it's mainly related to, to smallholders. And, um, um, that, that's not only China, but also other countries uh, have difficulties there. Um, so, so yeah, intellectual property right. I think the, the the regulation in China is in place, but uh, the enforcement is maybe uh, still. Uh, well, I also mentioned that in my speech um, is still an issue. Um, yeah. But but the regulation is there, and I think uh, many many foreign countries they. They don't follow the proper uh, route. They have to. They have to also to to follow the procedures and and register and protect their varieties. Uh, if you don't, yeah, then then of course, um, um, yeah, you will face difficulties everywhere in the world. Yeah, uh, and if you protect your variety in the Netherlands, doesn't mean it is protected in China. So you have to do it in 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 China also. And um, uh, but so as such, I think the regulation is in place. Uh, I think the situation is improving a little bit, but maybe the, 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 the colleagues from who are more, let's say, in the field uh, know better. Um, but there's still, uh, yeah, a long way to go. To go. Yeah, there's still a lot, a lot, work, a lot of work to do. Out. I, I can remember that that was already the case when uh, when I was working at the uh, the embassy almost 20 years ago. Um, just an hour out, I was wondering, now we're talking about intellectual property, um, it's, a, it's a theme that, you know, with any discussion on China um, is being discussed again. How does that work for, for your technology? Uh, maybe uh, just, um, how does Kodema protect uh, their technological innovations? Um, of course, we, we, have, we have our patents and trademarks in place, but I think there's not really, um, of course, we build high tech projects, but in the end, everything will be reproduced, adjusted, um, modified or whatever, and built in a similar way. I don't think protecting your technology is the way to go. I think you need to innovate, keep on doing new things, focus on other things than just hardware and make the whole project a success instead of just focusing on the, on on the technology of course you need to be on top of your technology on the we need to innovate continuously but um yeah hardware will eventually always be copied or modified or made better you're kind of the new kid on the block in china within this group at least uh, what what have you learned in the last couple of years? When I think of China, I think about a country which is extremely innovative, extremely creative, and well organized in that uh, in that respect. What can the rest of the le world learn from China in terms of because the world is changing with such a tremendous speed, you got to be on top of everything. What can we all learn, learn from? What have you learned from China? I learned from China a lot, a lot. Where to start? <laughs> um, I think in, in, indeed we we discussed um, aren't you too late or shouldn't you be aren't you where you not too early? I think in China things adapt very rapidly and things are changing continuously. They're trying out things, try on error, 
testing business models. Uh, sometimes they pay a lot of money for learning, learning money, but in the end they will find the way that works, the, the, the China way. And I think if you have the right business model, uh, you're never too late in China. It's such a big market and you need to be flexible, but there's opportunity for everyone. Thank you, Just. Uh quickly to you with my previous question on, on how to protect your, your technology or your innovations. Uh, you represent these iconic brands. Um, no doubt that there will be a lots of version of uh, Peter oh, Professional Osmo in Chinese or Osmo Code. Uh, with, uh, how do you battle that? How, how do you deal with this? Is it like learning money or investment? risk like just say you have no, to it's, it's like what just is also saying you have your patents uh, uh, in place uh, and we see uh, let's say the market is divided over global brands coming either from the us coming from asia uh, and then you have the local brands the new brands produced in china and it is not the brand it is the quality in the end what uh, what you offer to the market and the consistency the grower, they want to have year after year, they want to have the same quality coming out of that uh, bag. But whatever brand it is, as long as you can secure the quality, then you're in the business. If you come with a local produced and a cheap brand, and one year you offer a good quality, the next year and not, uh, not in line with the expectation, you're out. So it is more quality control than anything else, I would say. Okay. Thank you, uh, Arnett. There's um, an interesting question came in for Julienne, but I think it's also interesting uh, for Catherine. Julienne, starting with you, um, besides the improvement opportunities in the cold chain and production technology, do you see uh, the retail sector offline and online uh, being able to commit large volumes to growers um, say three to six months in advance, like is common in, in Europe and North America, because in this way then the growers are certain of their income and they can also invest in, in, in high quality flowers at a low cost. And what we see now, or that is the question, is that the retail is still highly fragmented. So they're not able or willing to commit long-term to growers. Can, what can you say about this? And Catherine, afterwards, I come to you with the same question. So, uh, according to the characteristic of a nursery stock business, I don't think there is too much retail business in this area. So, most of them, them are wholesale. Uh, so, from the market, um, just part of that is for the flower, but the nursery, stock plants in the bigger market, only including like the trees, shrubs, and some uh, horticulture supplies. So I think the retail business for this area is not big enough eh, because home garden business is not as good as, uh, it's not big as the landscape construction. So just to compare these two, part, two, big, uh, two markets, I think uh, wholesale is much bigger. So this is for the government purchase, uh, they have to, uh, all the companies have to be involved in the bidding system. So this is the different uh, with yeah. the uh, flowers. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Catherine, you then with the flowers, how do you see that issue that that there there's no commitment yet to high volumes with time in advance? We actually have been cooperating with uh, some chain supermarkets in China supplying fresh flowers and bouquets. And so we can tell from our experience that so far uh, uh, the family consumption for the flowers are not yet uh, there for the volume yet. Uh, even though they are spreading out over hundreds of the supermarkets uh, in China, uh, what people are searching with supermarkets are still for the novelties. So the new flowers that they don't usually see in their daily life. So we set our different strategies for our clients, of course, but at this moment we don't see them going for the volume yet. Do you think that will change? Um, Ed asked you what you see changing in the industry in the next, say, three years. Will that be an issue that, that needs to be changed in order to create a healthy, you know, more mature market? 
I think there's definitely potential, especially now with digital platforms. There are uh, chain uh, supermarkets, especially with a mixture of local products uh, with uh, imported products. They are a lot of there are a lot of uh, uh, digital florists already offering uh, much more cheaper and accessible uh, monthly subscripts uh, subscriptions of flowers. And together with that, we do see the potential of growing in retail, retail side. Uh, Walter, one more question uh, uh, for you. Uh, doing business in China, um, what, what, what do you recommend people from your perspective as the agricultural counselor? What steps should be should be taken first? I think uh, a lot is already uh, said. Um, um, yeah, you 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 need uh, to take time, uh, especially when when you are an SME. Um, it, it could take uh, quite some years before you 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 settled, your business uh, is profitable. So you yeah you you have to be able to to cope with that for a couple of years, and um, um, you need a Chinese uh, uh, partner. Um, if you just go there and think you can do business, it's very difficult. So you need a mm -hmm. partner, um, and, uh, and and I think that's well. That's already I think uh, Catherine said that, uh, or Julian said that. That's uh, good. Chinese partner, but uh, but what would you recommend people how to find a reliable? I mean, it's from both sides, right? Uh, you, you need to team up with someone you trust, you like, uh, you can have a, you can have a drink with you you. It's 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 uh, it's like it's almost like a marriage. But how do you find the right partner? Yeah, you have you have to go to China, um, join uh, join the activities the embassy organizes, for instance, uh, the missions RVO uh, RVO organizes. Um, many opportunities to learn to know the business in 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 China. We organize a lot of uh, a lot of events um, during the year in horticulture. Um, and, and also the other um, embassy uh, uh, offices, the, the consulate generals, the NBSOs, they organize a lot, on, a lot in horticulture. So, so just join these events and, and come and see and, uh, and take your time. Um, yeah, and, and sometimes uh, you don't find the right uh, partner, but, uh, but, but... You keep uh, on trying, uh, Walter, then. <laughs> what <are you> <laughs> Curious, um, uh, what you are doing at the uh, the Dutch embassy, your counterparts are doing at other European and, and international embassies. Um, China itself, the China Flower Association, is is also organizing annual events, half flower shows in in big cities. Now with COVID, uh, is 2021 another year of of large scale events? How does the Chinese government uh, do this in the coming months or or, or this year? Will the Again, be a flower show in, in Yunnan, in Shanghai, in Beijing. Well, in China, a, a lot of events uh, just happen uh, because in China you can more easily travel at the moment. Um, so the, the events take place, and uh, what you often see that they choose for a hybrid hybrid uh, model, uh, uh, offline, online, and that's what we uh, as an embassy also do: online, offline, uh, made a combination because. Uh, um, in, in China, you can organize things, and, and but you cannot travel into China. That's a big. That's the biggest problem now. Um, so, so we, we try to well design models where where we combine both. Um, maybe good to mention that our um, next uh, mission in will be in cold chain in June, and uh, and that will be also a hybrid model where we organize uh, sessions in um, in China. And uh, and but but from the Netherlands it will be mainly uh, online. Yeah, thank you, uh, Walter. I think it's time to slowly wrap up. Uh, add a few. Yeah, just uh, maybe one, one final suggestion to the audience: uh, if you have tried to to, get to to team up with somebody in China and it didn't work out, Renee tried for eight years. <laughs> uh, she came over to China, to Costa Rica and uh, it worked in Costa Rica. So if it doesn't work out in China, you can always come over to us here in Costa Rica. Yeah. <laughs> I also uh, I also saw that a few um, uh, people in the audience um, 
wanted to receive the contact details of our guests, we will make sure that in a follow-up mail, uh, we will uh, also mention the email addresses. So then you can contact uh, Arnaud, Juliana, Catherine, Just and Wouter yourself uh, directly. Uh, I think it's time to, to wrap up and I'm curious what, uh, what Tim thought of this session. So Tim, please uh, join, join us. us. Uh, with your webcam and camera. Oh, sorry, microphone and camera. We can see you. Well, um, thanks very yeah. much, Renee. And you can hear me okay. Oh, well, um, I would uh, really uh, like to thank um, uh, thank you both, Ed and Renee, for organising uh, this group today in this webinar. I want to thank Arno and Julianne and Catherine and Just and Walter for participating so uh, well and enthusiastically. I really, I've learnt, we've learned a lot uh, from what you've shared today. From the beginning we learnt about an e-commerce market that's growing from, um, by 1.5 billion over the next from between 2019 and 21 just to give a feel of the scale of change and how things are moving in, in China. We learned about the fact that at the moment, 50% of the market is typically still not the household market, the consumer, but this is likely to change to, this is like it is in Europe at 90% uh, by 2030. And that reflects a huge growth in the uh, middle class in China, the huge increase in the numbers living in cities. And so the, the, the market growth is still there and uh, developing as, as time uh, is moving on. I think the, uh, the key will be to position this industry as the one who wants to take some of that income of this uh, middle class. And of course, we're competing not with ourselves only, but with other industries and other leisure pursuits and other ways in which uh, consumers can spend their money. And so I think what we have seen today is the real need to identify what makes this market so distinct and what will make it successful to focus on developing the quality of product, uh, novelty within product, focusing on the marketing and the branding that can really be used to coordinate to develop um, this market. Certainly a respect for plant breeders' rights, intellectual property will be key to the future, but I think we are already seeing quite a change in this. And uh, I think it won't be long before China is the one uh, producing the new varieties and wanting to um, protect them in other countries. So, uh, we learned about the need to invest in time, in patience, uh, to understand the culture, to get to know people, to find a partner that really works for you, and that is so important. We learned that when in Rome, we need to behave like the Romans, and uh, that's certainly what we've learned um, with our experiences in China. Um, so for me, it's been fascinating. I want to really thank uh, Kodima and ICL in particular for their support and sponsorship of this event and for participating and contributing such a valuable content as well for uh, this session. So um, certain, and uh, on behalf of AIPH and FCI, thank you so much. And uh, we really appreciate all the efforts you put in today. And thanks, Ed and Rene. And we look forward to the next one. Back to you. Thank you very much. Just want to apologize to Mr. Ashat Mahmoud in Pakistan. He was really pushing us uh, to get more information on what can be done between Pakistan and China. But that question was so specific that we kept it uh, for, for ourselves. But uh, Mr. Mahmoud, we will bring you in contact with the, the speakers. So do that with them uh, directly, please. Uh, there were quite some other questions we could not uh, get answered today. Uh, we apologize for that, but we will uh, make sure that uh, our speakers, our guests, uh, get your questions. So don't worry about that. Uh, for now, I would like to thank you all very much. I would like to thank Tim, of course, uh, as, as the, the one who made it all possible, together with uh, Rolf and Kuh from the Floriculture International magazine. And all our guests, and we hope to see you the next time. Yeah, yeah. so we see you. See you here and uh, at the and end. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Bye.
Bye-bye. 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 B